For today's service, I'm going to go straight into the sermon because it will make the hymns and songs of worship that we will shortly sing as we lift up our hearts, minds and voices to God far more relevant. And I'm going to speak to you some of the words of the closest companion and friend that Jesus Christ ever had during his life on this earth. These words were written by him who we know as the Apostle John. He wrote them down roughly in the year AD 96 when exiled on the island of Patmos and it refers to a vision that he had seen. A vision is when the physical veil that hides eternity from mortal eyes parts and you can suddenly see true reality. And this is what the Apostle John wrote of what he heard and saw. It's Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labour, for their deeds will follow them. On March the 6th, 2007, I led a service to remember the 193 people whose lives were cut short due to the Herald of Free Enterprise disaster. The media, both television and newspaper, were present throughout the service and afterwards when we went up to the pier to throw flowers into the sea. This is what one Kent newspaper wrote at that time. Hundreds of people packed the Seafarer Centre in Dover's Snargate Street for the annual service organised by the British and International Sailor Society, led by port chaplain, the Reverend Sean Carter. People attending included family and friends of passengers and crew who lost their lives, plus former Herald crew members who wanted to pay their respects and remember their colleagues who died. The Herald of Free Enterprise ferry capsized at 6.30pm on March the 6th, 1987, just outside of Zeebrugge, after her bow doors were left open and water poured into the car deck. Mr Carter told the service, The Herald was the most catastrophic tragedy in East Kent. It is dreadful for so many people, but there were rays of light. The heroism shown by the crew and passengers the divers and emergency services, doctors, police, clergy and chaplains and counsellors who helped people in the aftermath. But he added, in East Kent, the wounds have been healed, but the scars will never go away. Following the service, many braved the high winds to walk to the Prince of Wales Pier, where the reeves were thrown into the sea. The wounds have been healed, but the scars never go away. Just think of that statement, and I'll mention it again in a short while. But if you read, wish to read the full article, you can find it online. But the service was very personal to me, because coming from Hythe in Kent, nearly everybody either knew somebody who lost their life during that disaster, or the families and friends of those who did. The 563 men women and children who boarded that ship on that fateful day had no inkling of what awaited them shortly after leaving the harbour. Without any warning, the 4,000 tonne vessel began to list and within just seconds, the happy passengers were transformed into desperate, terrified people as they were plunged into the icy sea of the English Channel and each of, and every one of them suddenly found themselves fighting for their life. It is a saying that there are just two certainties in life, taxes and death. But that is not true. We all know some very rich people in some of the big global companies with shrewd and crafty accountants that some of these companies or people, they manage to avoid paying very little or even in some cases absolutely no tax at all. But everybody be they millionaires or paupers or a member of the executive board of a global company, will face the ultimate certainty of death. None of us will make it out of this world physically alive. 
But those who trust in Christ will make it out of this world spiritually alive. And we will one day wait for all of the promises of God to be fulfilled and come true. Somebody said to me recently, they said, maybe you've been in ministry too long, Sean. Maybe you need a break. That's not true. It is true that for 31 years I have been standing up in front of people and preaching and proclaiming the great truths of the Christian gospel. But I do not need a break from it. That will come according to our reading when this life is over and I and all other Christians can rest from our labours. However many years I personally have left in this life, be they many or few, I want to be continuously serving and talking about my Lord and Saviour until my very last breath. And isn't that somebody Jesus told us in many of his parables, including the parable of the bridesmaid waiting for the um, groom and the bride to arrive, that not to be found lacking or wanting, but to be found active. You see, then one day when this life is over, then I can rest because the voice that spoke from heaven to the Apostle John was for me. It was for you as well, Christian. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labour for their deeds will follow them. I have often said throughout my ministry that not one single one of us is as wise as all of us. Although I have taught many people about the Christian life, about theology, doctrine, faith, spirituality, walking with the Lord and so on, I have also learnt much from many of those to whom I have ministered to over the years. I've learnt much from them as they have learnt much from me. I became the pastor of a church at the age of just 25 and I'd been the minister for about six months when an elder in the church became grievously ill. I had visited to him often, sat with him, prayed with him, sang hymns to God with him. And one day his family called. It's close, Pastor Sean, they said. The doctor just said, left and said he won't last the day. He wants to see you. I rushed around there. It was a small village, so I did not have far to walk. The family were all seated around his bedside, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren and a few other relatives. When I arrived, he said to them, I would like a few minutes alone with my pastor. And so they respectfully left and went to the next room. He asked me to pray with him and for him and read some verses of scripture to him. And one of the verses I've read to him, and yes, you've guessed it, was Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. You see, this man had been a member of that church since he was a child. He had been an elder for many, many years and served the Lord faithfully without a break, right up until his dying breath. And I read those verses, or that verse, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labour, for their deeds will follow them. At his request, we then sang the hymn, Abide With Me. We sat there and we sang it together. After we finished singing, he said, I'm ready. Pastor, would you call my family back in and let them see how a Christian dies? And so I invited the family to come back in. We sat there and chatted amongst themselves, um, to me and to him, although he did not say anything more. His breathing had become quite intensified and quite heavy, and he just sat there wheezing and breathing in the bed for about half an hour or so. He said nothing but just weakly smiled to everybody in the room. I felt I had stayed long enough, and not wanting to intrude on what was a very personal family time I was about to leave and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said wait wait a bit longer and I just felt I need to stay here so I did 
Shortly after that, maybe minutes or moments, the elder sat up in bed and looked up. See his eyes begin to glaze over and I could see the light fading from his eyes. He then smiled and almost rapturously said, I see him, I see my Lord. He has come to take me home. Those were his last words on earth. The light went out of his eyes. His spirit left his body like that. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labour, for their deeds will follow them. He was gone from this world, no more to be a part in its present fallen form. No more opportunity to serve God in this world. No longer would he be a part of the story of the human race. No longer would he be part of the history of the Christian church and our presence upon this fallen world. His story was finished. He had served the Lord faithfully. And when my time comes, I want to be found to be faithful in the Lord, still doing what he called me to do when I was a very, very young man. You see, this is the key from that word, those who die in the Lord. The Bible calls, the, the Bible calls death the enemy of God. Why? Why does the Bible say that death is the enemy of God? It's the enemy of us as human beings. The answer is because it destroys life. In contrast to God, who is the creator and the author of life. The Bible tells us very clearly that neither sin, pain, disease, death were ever part of God's original plan for the human race. He told the first man and woman that if they chose to act on their own free wills rather than follow the instruction given to them, that they would no longer just experience the good in his creation, but they would also experience the opposite of that. They would understand the knowledge of evil, the knowledge of sin, of pain, of death and suffering. And hasn't that been the story of the human race yes it has and that is exactly the reason why the bible says that god sent jesus christ into this world because sin pain disease death are all part of the kingdom of the fallen angel the bible calls lucifer or satan the one who rebelled against god and caused a catastrophic event to happen throughout all of creation and its many different dimensions and reality and its vast scope. Death is an enemy both of God and also of us as human beings. But Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. Jesus of Nazareth loved life on this earth. He enjoyed the pleasure of walking with his disciples, of holding children on his knee and teaching them of attending a wedding and drinking wine to honour the bride and groom, of eating with friends, of sailing in a boat, of sitting in a pub, talking to people. Yes, Jesus sat there with tax collectors and prostitutes, those who many Christians would try to avoid, but he sat there with them in their environment, in their pub, eating and drinking and talking to them. And some of the religious people criticised him for it. How can this be a holy man of God when he sits and talks and meets with such people? And what did Jesus say in response to that? It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And Jesus Christ came to cure the human soul and the human condition. That's why Mark records an incredible instant in the life of Jesus in his gospel. That an unclean spirit right at the beginning of Mark's account of Jesus' public ministry said this. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. People witnessed this. And that is why it is recorded in the testimony of the Gospels. The Apostle John wrote in his letters to the churches. In his first letter he wrote, but the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. 
that Jesus Christ tells us, that the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came to destroy sin and death forever as a part of creation. He came to restore creation to God's original plan. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote these words. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that Jesus was the only person in human history who was born without sin, who lived without sin, and who died sinless. Since that is so, some people may ask, why did he display so much anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve before his crucifixion? Was it a sign of weakness, some people ask? Because many people, Christian martyrs and others, have died without the immense emotional wrestling that the Gospels record Jesus experienced in Gethsemane. Socrates didn't anguish over his impeding death when he took the hemlock. History tells us that he proudly held his head up high. But here is the thing. When an individual or a person dies, they die for themselves. But when Jesus died, he battled all of the powers of darkness. Many have suffered physically as he did, but nobody suffered spiritually the way he did. A man of sorrows, the Bible calls him. Emotional torment can in many ways be worse than the spiritual torment. He sweat drops of blood, so acute was the stress, and we know that as a medical condition, that when a person is so stressed and so anxious that their blood vessels expand and burst and they can actually sweat drops of blood, and this is what happened to Jesus on the eve of his crucifixion because he knew the battle he was about to face against the spiritual powers of darkness. And it wasn't just the suffering on the cross, it was the emotional and spiritual suffering he was about to experience. Because the outstanding fact of the life of Christ is this, he suffered, the Bible tells us. He suffered a sense of loneliness, he suffered being misunderstood by his friends and relatives. He suffered the pressures of temptations misrepresentation and opposition, the betrayal of the traitorous kiss of a friend, the stripping naked, his scourging and torture at the hand of the Romans, the crown of thorns being put upon his head as a form of mockery, the burdensome cross, the exhaustion and collapse on the way to the cross, surrounded by mocking and jeering and humiliation of a baying crowd. And before all of this, he had the knowledge of his nation's fate and he prophesied to them what would happen because of their rejection of him and God's plan for them. He prophetically saw and prophesied about the Roman siege and then the conquering of Jerusalem that took place in AD 70 by the Roman general Titus. And you can read about it in history when the 5th, 10th, 15th and 17th legion of the Roman armories laid siege to the city. The starvation that happened that some people even ate their own children because they were so hungry. The absolute suffering that happened within Jerusalem. The streets were filled with bed blood as some fought against the Roman legion. Some of the Jewish inhabitants of the city fought for every inch of it in the surrounding area. And the Kidron Valley and the Valley of Hinnom were filled with corpses, history tells us. The sacred temple of the Jewish people was burnt to the ground and the treasury was plundered. The prisoners were taken. Some of them were burnt alive in their thousands. Others were crucified in their tens of thousands, so much so that they struggled to find enough wood to crucify all of the people. The land was stripped bare, we're told, of the wood in order to crucify many of those people. Others were taken as slaves and were forced to become gladiators and were killed in the arena, fighting wild animals or fellow gladiators. 
Others were sent to mines or to work on building projects, and others were taken to Rome, where they were forced to build the Forum of Peace. Imagine that. You're being forced to build a Forum of Peace when you know that the people who are asking you to build it have caused so much devastation to your own nation and to your own people. And we're told that the sacred menorah and the holy temple and the holy table from the temple were exhibited in the temple of peace. We're even told that some of these slaves are forced to build the Colosseum that still stands today. He who knew no sin in this life took on all of the sin of everybody. Jesus saw everything. He saw what was going to happen to Jerusalem. He saw every misdeed in human history that had happened, that was going to happen. My misdeeds, your misdeeds. Think about when we watch the news. The tide of misery and suffering that often floods from our television screens as information to us. And when we look at human history, we think all of the misdeeds, what we've done to ourselves as a human race, what we've done to our environment, what we've done to the animals and the creatures of this world, the misdeeds of humanity. The Bible tells us that all of those were put upon Jesus Christ. And in the Garden of Gethsemane on his eve of his crucifixion, when Jesus realised this, he asked his friends to stay with him and pray. He needed them. And they let him down. God needs preachers today to proclaim his message. I'm not going to let my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ down. Are you? God needs people to serve in his churches and the different roles and offices of the church and to support the work of the preaching of the gospel. Don't let him down. Many of the parables of Jesus were taught about being faithful to God because he is faithful to us. But we read in the Gospels when Jesus moved a short way away from his friends and fell on the ground to pray. The ones who confidently had said they would follow him to the end, they fell asleep. And when the guards came to arrest him, those who had pledged such loyalty to him ran away. Why was the cross necessary? If God were to forgive our sins without judging them, it would make a mockery of justice. And if God were to judge us for our sins of how we deserve to be judged, there would be no hope of eternal life or salvation for any of us. For all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the Bible tells us. And the cross was the only way to resolve this awful dilemma where both the justice and the mercy of God could be satisfied. That Jesus was clothed in the filthy, tattered rags of our deeds and our sins, and in turn we are clothed in his righteousness. Sin was therefore judged, and God was satisfied. But let me say this, if you do not accept what Jesus did on your behalf for your sins, your misdeeds, one day you will face the justice of God yourself. For every deed and word that violates the laws and principles he has built into creation, we will have to answer to him for that. If I faced God alone, the verdict would be guilty. But as God raises that gavel and begins to come down and strike it on the block, there's a hand that reaches out and the gavel falls on that where Jesus was once wounded but now it's just a scar remember I said I'd come back to that at the beginning of the message and that blocks God's justice and Jesus said I paid the price for this there's no more to be paid and God the Father himself said not guilty to the one who accepted Jesus into their life. Then I heard a voice from heaven say this, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labour for their deeds will follow them. God bless you. We're now going to sing the hymn Abide With Me, the hymn I sang with that elder. 
And after that, we're going to take communion and remember what Jesus did for us. I invite you to say these words in the form of a prayer with me. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weakness I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close, let your love surround me. Bring me near, draw me to your side. 
And as I wait, I'll rise up like the eagle, and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on by the power of your love. Lord, unveil my eyes, let me see you face to face. The knowledge of your love as you live in me. Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life. In living every day in the power of your love. I know indeed that you are beautiful, Lord. Put forth to me the power of your love by leaping over the mountains of my transgressions and wash me in the true blood of reconciliation. Lord, forgive us our sins. Wash us in the blood of Jesus and purify us from all unrighteousness as we take this bread and eat it as you told us to do in memory of you. As the same way that Jesus was broken in spirit and soul. And then his body was scourged, whipped and then crucified. We break the bread and we eat it. Remembering that he died for us. We now take the cup. The blood of Jesus Christ can purify and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, rid us of the stain of sin, so that because of the resurrection and life of Jesus Christ, we too have new life. Remember at the beginning of the message I brought this morning, I said that none of us will leave this world physically alive, but those who trust in Christ will leave it spiritually alive. And that's because of what Jesus did upon the cross and his blood that was shed and then his resurrection that is the sign of the future promise to us that we will spend eternity in a physical body. One that will not die or be subject to sin, pain or suffering of any kind because Jesus took it all once and for all throughout creation. So drink the sacred wine from the cup of our redemption. Me. You lift me up, set me free. 